let's go. Um, Yeah. All right. Uh, so let me remind you of some things. Um, so we're we're looking at what happens with what happens when you try to factor things in integral domains. Um, if I forget to say, every ring that shows up is an integral domain. So um, the idea of a prime number over the integers when you look at a random ring splits into two different two separate notions one is you can't you can't reduce it further uh which well we call it irreducible uh like i've been saying a week you're reducible if you can't write it as uh at the moment irreducible if i can't write it as a non-trivial product of two things and trivial is when i multiply by a unit and another another thing that matches what prime numbers are is what we call a prime element of a ring which uh, is what happens when if it divides a product then it divides one of the factors uh turns out you can be reducible and not prime like we saw uh so prime prime is stronger prime is if something is prime that's uh, more useful um <clears throat> Also, by the way, notice that prime, if, if an element is prime, that means that it generates the prime ideal and conversely, which is why we call it prime. So um, then we have two types of rings. And the goal today is to show that being a principal ideal domain is stronger. So you have unique factorization domains. And I call a ring a unique factorization domain, a UFT if I can factor everything into primes uniquely into reducibles. I guess by the turns out in the UFD irreducibles are primes, but um I, the definition says irreducibles. <clears throat> and the other kind of rings we had were principal ideal domains where every ideal is generated by just one thing. So if you go back, so once we talked about a lot of examples, so the integers are a PID, polynomial rings over a field are a PID, and, and those, are, those are the basic examples. And when you look away from that, like you look at polynomial rings over more than one variable or over the integers, those are not PIDs anymore. Um, so, the goal is that every PID is a unique factorization domain. And here's where we started. Um, so part of this looks just like what we're doing for polynomials. Um, we said that on any ring, well, let's say a domain. Principal ideals being contained in each other was the same as the elements in the bigger ideal, the generator of the bigger ideal dividing the generator of the smaller ideal. And if you have division, divisibility both ways, um, that means that there are associates the what you multiply by must be a unit. So for example, five and negative five generate the same ideal over the integers. And the trivial ideal is what you get when exactly when the generator is a unit. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm, I'm gonna so that's the past to the future. I'm gonna do something that we basically did for polynomials, but it's gonna it's gonna be the same thing. Maybe I'll I'll do it like in the um, like in the book. Um 
let r be a PID and let a be non zero in elements of r. Then the ideal generates is a maximal if and only if a is irreducible. Okay, so I mean, you've seen the proof of this for polynomial rings, and it's the same proof. So Suppose that this ideal is maximal. Um, how can I use these properties down here? Especially the first one. The first one is the most important one. Welcome. Um, to show that if, if the ideal generated by A is maximal, then A has to be reducible. Where do I start? Define an ideal that's contained in A, the maximal ideal. Uh-huh. So how am I gonna okay, how am I, how am I gonna find that? You can just define it as B or just define an ideal, a new ideal in the um that's can that's uh within A. I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, like, suppose it, it exists, or like, I don't, I mean, in principle, it doesn't exist, right? So, I mean, I think this proof should go by contradiction uh, because because being reducible and being non-maximal are things are easier to work with. So we're trying to say, imagine that it wasn't irreducible, then I could find the ideal that Sensor is talking about, which would be a contradiction. Um, and then, and then, and then it, it would have to be reducible. So, okay. If A is reducible, so I have, I have this and I guess, um, I have this in a way that B and C are not units. Because otherwise it would be a stupid factorization. <clears throat> then uh, how could I show that this is, um, how can I find an ideal containing this, this ideal that I'm claiming is maximal? And you know, this is what I'm trying to use. You A is contained in the maximal generated by either B or C? Yes, exactly. All right. You you get a point, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> so this would mean that B divides A and C divides A, and, and either is going to work. Um, 
B divides A means that um, the ideal yeah, generated by B contains the ideal generated uh, by A. Now, well, there's two ideals containing A. Uh, I wanted to, so there, there's two obvious ideals um, that this ideal shouldn't be the it, A itself and the unit ideal. So why is this ideal not the unit ideal? Is maximal, right? Is it because B isn't a unit, and so there's nothing that's going to make the ideal have one in it? Yeah, exactly. It's it's because B is not a unit. Um, because we we said here an ideal, and a principal ideal is the whole the whole ring if the generator is a unit, if and only if the generator is a unit. Right, Duncan gets a point as well. Um, and the other thing I need to make sure, this is really like when you when you say a prime in the uh, an, uh, an integer is a prime, if and only if it's only divisors or one and itself. This is one. And now for the itself part. Um, why why is b not a because a and b are not associate because a is equal to bc the product of two non-units exactly so by yeah thank you very much uh by the second line here Because C is not a unit. So B and A aren't associates. Uh, and this is a contradiction. So, okay. So I have, so I found an ideal. Sorry. I found an ideal in between A, the maximal ideal and the total ideal, and it's different from both. So this is now maximal. Um, which is a contradiction. So that's one half of the proposition proof. <clears throat> okay, uh, well, you I'll give you 10 seconds to copy this if you if you're doing that. Tiago is asking if anyone wants to exchange phone numbers to study. Um, if you want, I can send an email to the whole class later and tell them to contact you. I think that's a great idea. I don't appreciate that, but I mean, it's not, I don't think it's necessary. Thank you, though. I'm All right. <laughs> Okay, uh, so, okay, uh, so the converse. Okay, so we've sort of, I mean, this was kind of ugly. I did what you're not supposed to do, or you really, I had no reason to say contradiction here. I should have said, suppose that A is reducible, then it's not maximal, but yeah, what are you gonna do? Um, so now we're going the other way, um, which is pretty much the same. So if A is irreducible, I need to show that the ideal it generates is maximal. And I mean, it's pretty much, pretty much the same. So, um, If it wasn't maximal, then what would, what would happen? Um, so by definition, 
there would exist an ideal in between in between the principal ideal and the whole ring. Now, what is, what is the one thing I know about this ring? Maybe I should just copy the statement. Maybe I'll think about the one thing. But that's true. Oh, sorry. That's not always true because it's, I mean, that's not true for a random ideal. That's true for a principal ideal. Uh, the, the thing that we proved on Wednesday said that a principal ideal is containing another principal ideal when this happens. So you you told me like the, the next step after, after showing that I is principal, we're going to do what you just said. Um, but what, how do we show that, I, how do we know that it, I is principal? Well, it's a PID, right? So right. ideals. Yeah, who said that? Duncan, okay. Thank you, uh, exactly. So this proof definitely doesn't work if, if it's not a PID. Uh, because there there could be ideals in there that have more than one generator that you need more than one thing to generate. So the key thing here is that since R is a PID, I is principal. And now I do what Roy said. This means that B divides A and B is not a unit because um, because the ideals are not the same. So now I'm just doing the same reasoning. B is not associated to A because B um, is not a so a must be reducible so the proofs look exactly almost exactly the same uh, going the opposite direction but in the, in this direction we use fundamentally that the ring is a bid <clears throat> we used it in an essential way um okay Any questions? Okay, so on in at under in a PAD, um, every reducible is prime. <clears throat> so uh, based on what we just so the trick is to use the the ideals um so so what happens if an element in a pad is irreducible based on what we just proved
of the ideal generated by it is maximal. Exactly. So, and now what is the one thing that you learned last semester about every maximal ideal? I guess it from from zero. Well, zero is not reducible. Would it just be the definition that it's not a subset? That's not what I want to do. Um, I mean, there's there's two special kinds of ideals that we really care about. We have maximal ideals, which are the ideals. I, I think you should think it's the ideals where the quotient is a field and prime ideals. Those are the ideals where the quotient is a domain. And what's the relation between maximal and prime ideals? Every maximal ideal is prime. Exactly. Every maximal ideal is prime. And now, by definition, B in prime is exactly the same as saying that A is prime. If BC is in the ideal, yeah, I'm going to say. So remember, um, the ideal generated by A is a set of multiples of A. It's the elements that A divides. So if A divides a product, that means that the product is in the ideal. And by the ideal being prime, one of them has to be in the ideal. And that's the same as saying being in the ideal is the same as being a multiple. So, you know, be, being in the ideal is the same as being a multiple. So when I say a product of two things are a multiple of A, only when one of them is a multiple of A, that's the same as saying a product of things is, is in the ideal, only, one, only when one of them is in the ideal. Remember that the definition, that's the definition of prime ideal as well. A multiple is in the, uh, a product is in the ideal, only when one of the uh, elements is in the ideal. And that's it. So this is the case of, this proof just came out of things we know. I really didn't do any work here. <clears throat> okay. So I'm, I'm here claiming that we have to be careful with the distinction between irreducible and prime. Turns out if you, are working over a PID, you don't have to. They're the exact same thing. So how does the proof? So now I'm trying to I'm trying to get to this U of T business. Um so you know if you let's see. Say I give you some factorization of primes. This is very useful to show the, the uniqueness. Um, so, I mean, how do you know that this is not true? Um, you know that this is not true, uh, not because you're computing these numbers in your head, hopefully, uh, but you know that there's a three on the left and the three on the left must divide the right. And that means that it has to divide five, seven, or 19. And you know, all of those are prime. So, um, So this is, you know, this is why we care that every irreducible is prime on a PAD. Now, 
Um, I'm gonna fail of, of showing that every PID is a U of D. Uh, here's what I'm gonna do. Um, take an element. I wanna factor it into reducibles. Uh, so if A itself is reducible, we're done, right? And what do we do if what what do I do if A is not irreducible? Think of what you do for to show to show that numbers, uh, integers factor into primes. This is probably not the right answer, but at least the most brute force way would be um, trying a, some division algorithm, like uh, seeing a remainder or reducing modulo sum prime. That would be awesome if I could do it. Uh, <laughs> but but I don't, there's no such thing as a division algorithm for a lot of rings. Uh, and actually having a division algorithm makes a ring very special and we call that a euclidean domain which is the next thing i'm going to talk about after pids so that would be awesome if if you could do it uh sadly this is not the way to go because um i don't know you know for example i mean here actually say you're working with these numbers these numbers are a pid um as we will see so these are integers plus an integer times i, but how do you, I'm not sure that I can do division with remainder here, or even less so, um, I think, I think this number, let's see, I think negative 19. Here, I'm pretty sure you, I think it's a, it's known that you can't do division. So division with remainder is not a guarantee uh, that we have right now. We have that for polynomials and for the integers and that's not gonna work. But I mean, what do you know if if, a, if an element in a ring, it's not a reusable, what is the one thing you know? I'm not trying to find, I mean, this is a ring I know nothing about and an element I know nothing about. I'm just trying to show it exists. I'm not trying to construct it. So. How do you, you know? A will equal to some product of other uh, reducible elements. Right. Or non-unit reducible elements. A is the equal, right, exactly. So if A is not a reducible, A is the product of B times C. Now, if B and C are re irreducible, that's great. And if if not, what if B is what, what if uh, B is reducible? Then it's also the product of two numbers. So I write it like this. So and now I go if you want C one are irreducible, that's great. Do you see where this is going? You factor. Um, the question I have, the big problem I have is, um, do I ever, is there any guarantee that this ends? So 
I'm really, I'm not solving anything. I'm just pointing out a, a big problem we have here. Um, How do you know that that works for the integers? How do you know that if you start with a, a whole number, you start dividing and dividing, you end up always with a product of primes? Isn't that the point of like prime factorization? There will always be at least a set of primes that will comprise the number. Yeah, but how do you know? But you know that's because. But how do you know that prime factorization works? How would you prove that, you know, if to someone who didn't know it or who didn't believe it? How do you know that you always reach a prime number? Like maybe you should be worried, you know, you take a, you take a number, you take a really big number and it's not prime. So you factor it. And then the fact, the factors are not prime either. So you factor those. And then the factors that you get are not prime. So you factor those. And this is probably wrong, but is it because it's well ordered? Yes, that's exactly why. So can you can you explain what that means? That just means we know there's a least element in the domain. Yeah, basically, yeah, you can do it. But one way to see this is um, there's a so every every set of natural numbers has the smallest elements. So there's a smallest number that can't be factored into primes. So. I, I guess let's let's do it. Let A be the set of numbers that can be factored into primes. So you know, I mean natural numbers. Let n not be the smallest element in A. Um, so now what happens? Well, either n not is prime or it isn't. Actually, no, it's not, it's not prime. Um, n not is not prime. because then it could be factored into primes. And I'm saying it's a number that can't be factored into primes. So, so n naught is composite. But then what happens is that a and b must be smaller than n naught, which is the smallest thing that can't be factored into primes. So A and B can be factored. And if A and B can be factored, then N naught can be factored as well. And what does this mean? It means that A is empty because that's the only way that it doesn't have a smallest element. Okay, that's the, I mean, the good news is we now know how to prove the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. The bad news is um, this doesn't work for a ring because rings don't have, don't come with order rings. <clears throat> but I mean, the idea basically, you can, if you keep doing this over and over, um, the numbers get smaller and they can't get smaller than one. So you must finish somewhere. And for polynomials, it's the same thing. Uh, 
basically. What, how do you know that every polynomial factor seems to be reducible? So how do you know that it doesn't factor and factor and factor and, and you never have irreducibles? Because the degree always decreases. Exactly. So you can do the same thing, but instead of look at the smallest polynomial, which doesn't really make sense, you can look at the polynomial of the smallest degree and you get the same conclusion um, for a PADR, we can't do this. Um, because rings don't come with uh, rings don't come with any sort of ordering or size or anything like that that we can use. So what we got to prove now is that somehow this still works for a PID. Um, so this is what we show. Um, Let R be a PID. <clears throat> Let's see, let uh, I1, I2, blah, 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 be an infinite sequence of ideals. such that one is contained in the next and it goes on forever. So you have an ideal, then you have a bigger ideal, then you have a bigger ideal. And as you know, in a PID, this is basically divisibility. So I'm saying you have a number and then you have a divisor and a divisor and a divisor and a divisor. So what I'm, if this happens, what I'm saying is that there exists an N such that i n is i n plus one, such that they're, they're all equal. It's sort of like, if I give you an infinite decreasing sequence of natural numbers, you know that eventually it's just constant, right? I, I start with a thousand and then I keep going down. I can't go down forever unless, you know, I arrive at three and then I stay at three forever. And it turns out that ideals uh, for a PAD do exactly that. Um, so uh, that's what we're gonna prove, but I should say this is called the ascending chain condition. Um, if if an if a ring has this property, where a, a, an increasing chain of ideals always it always ends up being constant, um, we say it satisfies the ascending chain condition, um, or we say that the ideal, the ring is an Ethereum. I mean, Ethereum is one of the most important properties of a ring. Okay, um, so let's let's prove this. So it's clear where we have to start. We have to start saying if we have a sequence. So, um, so what I need to do is somehow use that R is a PAD. Um, 
So I need to find an ideal that, uh, and use that that ideal is printable. I mean, I have infinitely many ideals that I could apply this to, but I'm gonna let you know right away that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, the ideal I don't wanna, I wanna look at is not I1, I2, or I3, or any of those. So how can I get an ideal for this, from this sequence of ideal? This is, I think this is a really hard question, but I'm gonna let you have a shot at it. I'm trying to show that there's a biggest ideal um, in this sequence. So how can I have a shot of finding the biggest ideal? Any guesses? Do they have to be proper or? I don't know that they're proper. I mean, if if one of them in the sequence is the whole ring, then you can't get any bigger. So, I mean, sure. I mean, you could take R, but I want to take somehow the supreme. I want to take the smallest ideal that contains them all. Oh yeah, I'm gonna tell you because this is um, this is tricky. Um, what I'm gonna do, let's call it J, is take the union of all of these. So, um, so the thing is, when you take the union of ideals, is not an ideal in general, but when they're containing each other like this, it is an ideal. Um, so. J is an ideal. And now if I show that this is an ideal, well, it's gonna contain, it's gonna contain all of them. And it's, well, it's gonna be the smallest one containing all of them clearly, because something that contains all of these ideal has to contain the, the union. Um, so how does this go? I need to show that it's close under some, well, Maybe I won't check everything because the idea is always the same. So by definition, what does it mean if I have an element um, containing the union? What's a union of sets? I'm sorry, what was the question? What, so what do I, in terms of the, the I, these ideals, uh, what does it mean for A to be an element of the union? That means it's in one of the ideals inside of the union. Exactly, it's in one of them. So by definition, it means that for some N and one, A is in one of them, A, I, N, one. And for B is the same thing, but of course it doesn't have to be the same number. So now why would the sum be containing the union? Let's say that A is containing the third and B is containing the sixth. What would happen to the sum? Let's say, yeah? It should stay inside the largest ideal because it's an additive subgroup. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and because they're in order, right? Um, 
one, one is containing two, containing three. So um, if you just say, take a bigger number. So if N is bigger than both of those, then A and B are both containing the bigger one. And then, well, then the sum is contained because the bigger ideal is an ideal. And that means that the sum is contained in, in J. So that's how you show it for the sum, which is a the trickiest thing. You have you have two elements in there, then they they appear somewhere in the in the sequence at some position. And that means that they appear at different positions, but they both appear in the biggest one. And the, the biggest ideal is an ideal, so the sum uh, is close for the sum. So you know, taking the union of ideals or vector spaces or those kind of things are never they 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 tend to never give you ideals or whatever algebraic structure you want, but it does work if they're if they're all in a chain. So this is why it's close for the sum. Um, for the product, it would be the same thing. So if you have just an element in the ring and an element in J, A is contained in I n for some n, and then C times A is contained in I n because I n is an ideal. <clears throat> and, and that means that the product is contained in J as well. And that, I mean, that's all you need to show that something is an ideal because take C equals zero, you have that zero is contained in there, and then you have the opposite. So, so J is an ideal. So, okay, let me remind you, I'm trying to show. If R is a PID, then IN is eventually constant. Notice that if it's constant, it's going to equal J because you just, then you just have a union where everything is contained in what, wherever you stabilize. Um, so, so now that I know that J is an ideal, how do I use the hypothesis I haven't used? Oh, I have one minute, I have to tell you. So, now we use the hypothesis since R is a PID, J is principal. And this is gonna mean that, uh, what's it gonna mean? That there exists some element in R such that J is, uh, is just generated by that element. So, how can I finish the proof? You show either that um, J is maximal or that J has to bar itself. I, I yeah, I have no idea if J is maximal or not. But no. what I can do. I remember from like algebra one where or abstract algebra one where we showed that um, J is either maximal or it's R itself, and then in which case the generator A is is um is the identity. Right, if it's the ring itself, yeah, but uh, I might be off base. Yeah, but that's not gonna. There's no reason for that to happen now. You could think of a sequence of ideals. You know, what if, 
all the all the i's were the ideal generated by four in the integers in the end you would just have four you wouldn't have a prime number which would give you a maximum ideal so what you do is just what we what we already just did if j is generated by one element that means that that element is in j and that means that for some number a is contained in here and this means that all the multiples of a are contained in here and this means that j is contained in i n which is contained in j so i mean they're they're both equal and everything everything after the nth uh, ideal is just the same. So once you know that there's only one element in J that you need to generate it, it's just a question of where that element appears in the chain. A is in here. And then from then on, they all have to be, they all have to contain J. So they all have to just be J. This is a really, I mean, it's kind of a strange proof. It's a proof to go back and look at later, honestly. Um, but uh, it's a very cool idea, very useful idea. Uh, okay, I'm going to let you go now.